welcome to my channel. I'm Scott and in this video I am going to walk you through the process of valuing Peabody Energy stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. Peabody is the largest coal company in the world. Their primary business consists of the mining, selling, and distribution of coal. Coal is mainly used in electricity generation and steel making. Thermal coal is burnt to create steam that drives turbines and generators for the production of electricity. Peabody also markets, brokers, and trades coal through offices in China, Australia, the UK, and the US. Coal is so important because it lights our houses and the streets, it provides heat, and powers most of the equipment and machinery in our homes and our offices. Coal is the most abundant source of electricity. It currently provides more than one-third of the world's electricity. The company is headquartered in St. Louis, Missouri and was founded in 1883. The ticker trades on the New York Stock Exchange, Santiago Stock Exchange, and Deutsche Börse. Let's get started with the model. This is a mid cap company, 3.5 billion market cap. They're trading at $26 a share and they have 138 million shares outstanding. Let's look at their financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. They did have negative free cash flow in 2020 but positive in the other years. Net income is the profit or loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. That was negative in 2020 and 2019, positive in 2018 and 2021. Revenue is a sales for the company, and that doesn't look so great. It goes from 5.6 billion down to 3.3 billion. But it did increase half a billion from 2020 to 2021. This is the company's income statement. The top line is the revenue of the sales. Below that is the cost of revenue. These are all the expenses directly related to generating the revenue. All the expenses to mine and then deliver the coal are part of cost of revenue. Revenue minus cost of revenue gives you your gross profit. And that has decreased from 1.5 billion to 765 million. Below that is their operating expenses. Examples are depreciation and amortization. Gross profit minus operating expenses gives you your operating income. And that was really strong in 2021 compared to prior years because their revenue is a lot lower in 2021 compared to 2018 and 2019. But their operating income was actually higher than 2019 and a bit lower than 2018, but their margins were much higher in 2021 compared to 2018. They spent $183 million of interest on their debt in 2021, which is higher than prior years. Then you have other income and expenses. These are all the gains or losses, not part of the company's core operations. They had a big asset impairment in 2020. That's why their net income was so bad. Below that is their pre-tax income, then their taxes, and the bottom line of the income statement is their net income which was pretty healthy in 2021 at 370 million. This is the company's income statement from their annual report. In 2021, they had 3.3 billion of revenue. Of the 3.3 billion of revenue, 1.8 billion is in the US, about 1.5 billion is exported, 932 million in seaborne thermal mining, these are their mines in New South Wales and Australia. 720 million in metallurgical mining. Metallurgical is coal used for steel making. And thermal is coal used for electricity. Almost 1 billion in Powder River Basin. This is that big mine in Wyoming. And about 700 million in other US locations. These are mines in Illinois, Indiana, New Mexico, Colorado, and Arizona. They spent 2.6 billion in order to generate just 3.3 billion of revenue. They spent over 300 million of depreciation, depletion, and amortization, 45 million in retirement of assets, 85 million in selling and administrative expenses. So they had a really nice operating profit in 2021. And the reason they had this big loss was this $1.5 billion asset impairment. An asset impairment is a non-cash item. You decrease the value of an asset on your balance sheet pass through the loss onto your income statement, but we add it back on a statement of cash flows. It's like if you buy your car for $30,000 and say in five years, your car is worth $15,000, but you just give it away to somebody. It's not like you lost $15,000. You already paid for the car five years ago. 
but your assets do go down $15,000. They spent more interest on their debt in 2021 than 2020 and 2019. They earned $3 per share in 2021, compared to a loss of $19 in 2020 and a loss of $2 in 2019. This is the company's statement of cash flow. As a top line is operating cash flow, that's how much cash the company generates or loses from its operational business. You could think of operating cash flow as net income converted to cash because net income is your accounting profit or loss. It's not actual cash. They generated lots of cash in 2018, $1.5 billion. They were paying a dividend back then, but they don't pay a dividend currently. But they generated over $400 million of cash flow in 2021. I have a feeling they're going to bring back their dividend in 2022. Then you have CapEx, Investments in Property, Plant, and Equipment. When they purchase the rights to a location for a mine, that goes into CapEx. And when they buy machinery to work at the mine, that goes into CapEx. Those dollar amounts are carried on their balance sheet, then depreciated over the useful life. Operating cash flow minus CapEx gives you your free cash flow. It was negative in 2020, but it looks a lot better in 2021. With that free cash flow, they paid down a lot of debt. In 2020, they added a lot of debt, but they did pay down debt in 2018 and 2019. They also bought back lots of stock in 2018 and 2019. When a company buys back common stock, it decreases the shares outstanding and makes sure shares more valuable. This is their operating cash flow section on their 10K. And the way you calculate operating cash flow, you start with your net income or net loss. Then you add or subtract the non-cash items on the income statement, adjust for changes in working capital. In 2020, even though they report an accounting loss of 1.9 billion, they only lost 10 million of cash flow. Because of that asset impairment, we have to add it back here. In 2021, they generated a little more cash flow than their net profit. That's mainly due to depreciation and amortization of $308 million. Back in 2015, their revenue was close to $7 billion, but it has been coming down quite a bit over the years. But it looks like there's been a little uptick at the end of 2021. Hopefully that continues. Even though they had lots of revenue back here, they weren't generating much cash flow. It was actually negative part of the time. The forecast is for their revenue to grow a lot in 2022, then start to slope down a little in 2023 and 2024. And the forecast is for their operating cash flow to be positive throughout 2022 and 2023. This is their investing and financing sections in their statement of cash flows. In their investing section, they spent 180 million on property, plant, and equipment. It looks like they had a cash inflow and outflow in a joint venture each year. So in their investing section, they had a cash outflow of 130 million. In their financing section, they paid down 285 million of debt. They added 270 million of common stock. This is the equity section on their 1231 balance sheet. They have 1.8 billion of equity. They raised 3.7 billion by selling common stock and they lost 900 million from running their business. They also bought back 1.4 billion of common stock. When a company buys back common stock, those shares are removed from the open market and put onto the company's balance sheet in treasury stock. This is a contra equity account, so it brings down your equity balance. Let's look at the capital structure. 1.8 billion of equity, 1.2 billion of debt. They're 60% equity, 40% debt. If they used all the cash on their balance sheet to pay down their debt, they would only have 227 million of debt left over. This red line is their debt balance since 2015. They're doing a really good job at decreasing their debt. It was really high, but they paid most of it down in 2017 and they kept it pretty steady. Their equity balance is slightly higher than a debt balance, but they do keep a good amount of cash on their balance sheet. It looks like management is trying to clean up the balance sheet and getting the company to become more efficient. I gave them the highest whack on Finbox, 8.5%, and that's the discount rate we're going to apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated the terminal value, which is all cash flows past year four, that's 5.7 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $5.2 billion. We divide that by 138 million shares and we get a calculated stock price of $38. They're trading at $26, so they're trading at a 32% discount. It's a buy according to the model. The forecast is for the company to have 3.4 billion of revenue by the end of 2024. So I grew their revenue 0.7% for the next four years. That would hit 3.384 billion in 2024. That's how I got their future revenue estimates.
On average, the company converts 10% of their revenue into free cash flow. So I multiplied their future revenue estimates by 10%. That's how I got their future free cash flows. The website simply Wall Street values the company at $45. They're saying it's 47% undervalued. Three analysts price this stock and the average price target is 23, the lowest 13, the highest 32. This is where the stock has been trading the last five years. It was over $45 in the middle of 2018, then fell below $3. It's gone up 800% since that low point. Look at 2022, how much it's gone up from 10 to 26. You can see they used to pay a dividend, then they cut their dividend in 2020. This bottom chart is the price of coal. And that's why the stock has been coming up a lot, because the price of coal has been coming up. But the stock price was really high in 2018. But coal prices look like they were pretty low. This bottom chart is Arch. They're the second largest publicly traded company in the US. And their stock price looks a lot closer to coal than BTUs. They're trading at an all time high. BTU is about half the price it was in 2018. So maybe there's a lot more upside to Peabody. If you invested in the S&P 500 five years ago, you'd be up almost 100% but you'd be down 7% with this company. And if you invested when the stock was over $40, you'd be down about 50% right now. They used to pay a quarterly dividend, 12, 13, 14, 15 cents. It looks like they paid a special dividend in March 2019 because they were generating so much more cash flow. Their beta is 1.13, so the stock moves a little more than the market. It's gone up 700% in the past 52 weeks while the S&P is up 17%. The 52 week low is three, the high is 28. The stock is trading well above its 50 day and 200 day moving average. About 10 million shares are traded each day on this stock. Of the 138 million shares outstanding, 107 million are on float, 70% are held by institutions, and over 12% of the shares are shorted. They had about 7,500 employees five years ago but they're down to below 5,000. If you invested $10,000 into this company when they started trading in 2017, you'd be down to $8,500 today. That's a 15% loss. In the past 12 months, there's been no insider buying, just selling. 300,000 shares, 2 million and 68,000. Here's a list of all the insider selling, the date, the person or company, the shares and the price. Everyone would have been much better off not selling because the stock price now is a lot higher than all these prices. Half the shares are held by institutions, 29% by the general public, 19% by hedge funds, and 1% by insiders. The biggest shareholders, Elliott Management, then State Street, BlackRock, Vanguard, and Dimensional Fund. Let's look at their financial ratios. An amazing PE, that stock price over earnings per share. This means investors are paying $9.50 for $1 of earnings. A really good price of sales of 1.1, that stock price of a sales per share, much better than a market median average. Also a great price to book, that stock price of a book value per share. Let's look at their non-current assets, 3 billion of PP&E, 35 million of operating leases, and 162 million of investments. Let's look at their non-current liabilities, 1.1 billion of debt, 27 million of deferred income taxes, this should increase their taxes in the future. 650 million of asset retirement obligations. An asset retirement obligation is when a company is responsible for removing equipment and cleaning up the area. This is pretty common with a mining company because there tends to be a lot of cleaning up and remediation after they mine a certain area. 200 million of retirement benefits. They owe 27 million on the operating leases and 200 million of other. They have a good return on invested capital of 13%. They can easily cover the interest payments with their operating income. They have a really good ROE at 21%. The market average is 2%, the median is 7%. A good current ratio of 1.9, that's current assets over current liabilities. And their quick ratio is 1.7. Let's look at their current assets, 950 million of cash, 350 million of receivables, this is how much money others owe them. 227 million of inventory and 270 million of other. Let's look at their current liability. 60 million of debt and 872 million of payables. This is how much money they owe others. 
In 2021, they generated 244 million of free cash flow and they have nearly 900 million of working capital. So they have 1.1 billion of funding. So the company seems to be well capitalized. The best way to look at ratios is to compare them to companies in the same industry. There are seven companies in the same industry as Peabody. And if Peabody has number in red, they're worse than the average. If they have number in blue, they're better than the average. They spend more in CapEx than the average company. They have the same debt to equity ratio as average. Most companies pay a dividend, they do not. But I'm pretty sure they're gonna bring it back this year. They generate lots of free cash flow. They're the largest company on this list. Their price to book is a little worse than average. Their PE is better than average. They do have the worst price to free cash flow and their price to sales is a little better than average. They generate more revenue than any company on this list, but their revenue has been coming down a lot. Their three-year annual revenue growth rate is negative 16%. The average is negative 5%. So to summarize, I have them trading at a 32% discount. And as you could probably tell from this video, coal is a really important commodity. And if the price keeps going up, so will this stock price. And the company did a great job in 2021. They did grow their revenue from 2020, but they managed their expenses really well. So they had great margins. Even though the stock price came up a lot the past year or so, it seems like there could be a lot of upside potential. I ranked their free cash flows and revenue 5 out of 10, their ratio 7 out of 10. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.